And then um, I will tie it up in a nice little bow at the end and thank you all. And uh, if you want and have any last minute things you want to add on, um, that'll be your chance. Sounds good? Sounds great. Any questions? I have okay. a confession. Yes. I kept thinking, are we making a documentary or am I supposed to have watched a documentary? <laughs> are you <laughs> fucking <laughs> watch the documentary? I did live through the crack epidemic here, so that's Jamie. how I will talk about it. Don't, Jamie, don't let me ask say me so. about a specific moment in the document. You are so lucky that you are my family, Jamie. I, I swear to God. So sorry, but Hello and a welcome everyone to Connecting the Dots. My name is Ignacio Rivera and I am your host and I'm here with a panel of wonderful people. Um, they're gonna introduce themselves. So let's start with uh, Jamie. Hi, Jamie Grant. Uh, I'm a recovering addict and activist. Uh, I live here in DC. I do LGBTQ, racial justice and uh, sex positive activism. Thank you. All right, Hari. Hi, I am Hari Ziad. I'm originally from Cleveland, but live in Brooklyn now. I'm a writer and storyteller, editor-in-chief of a website called Race Bader that covers race, gender, sexuality, issues from an abolitionist lens. Um, and also the author of a new book out now called Black Boy Out of Time. Yes, get the book, get the book. I got it. All right. <laughs> and last but not least, Kenyan. Hey everybody, I'm Kenyon Farrow. Uh, I am back in my hometown, Cleveland, Ohio, where I recently moved uh, back to. I'm the co-executive director of an organization, Partners for Dignity and Rights. I have a long history doing um, uh, organizing around uh, public health, HIV, uh, queer issues, uh, as well as the criminal justice system. I'm also the contributing editor with thebody.com and a contributor to a new anthology that is coming out sponsored by Colin Kaepernick called Abolition for the People. Oh, yes, thank you. All right, thank you everyone uh, and welcome. I'm really happy that you all were able to come and talk about this. Uh, today we're talking about the documentary, Crack Cocaine, Corruption and Conspiracy. And so usually when I do Connecting the Dots, I you know ask one person to come and talk about this, but after seeing the documentary, it was so powerful and actually, I have to say, it was actually triggering to watch uh, that documentary. And I was trying to remember how old was I when, that, uh, when the crack epidemic like hit. I uh, was probably 11 or 12 around that time. Yeah, so I wanna, I wanna hear like initial reactions about um, this documentary. I'll start. Um, my initial thoughts to seeing this was like, it was, it was a great just reminder of just how vast this issue is and how many um, areas of our lives is affected. I mean, we all know people who have um, been affected by this issue in one mm -hmm. way or another. Um, and I don't think that I've ever like forgotten that, but I think um, sometimes when we talk about generational trauma or the effects of the past, um, it's, it starts to get a little bit theoretical. And this was just very clear on just mm -hmm. how significant this was in changing how um, communities interacted with one another. Um, seeing the kids that were like, we can't even sit on the stoop um, mm -hmm. together. Like how did that affect the ways that could, they were able to build community with each other, the ways that um, enemies were made out mm -hmm. of people who lived in the same neighborhoods, like um, they, uh, neighbors turning on each other, families turning on each other, because there was just nothing really that uh, else that they, they felt they had access to to do to try and address this issue. Um, and that will definitely have just like super long reverberations, especially because we know that the government hasn't done anything really to address um, what happened. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. it just was a good reminder of just how much of that we're still dealing with um, now especially living in Brooklyn, a gentrifying Brooklyn, um, mm -hmm. where, you know, the, that's not something that we talk about every day anymore, um, but it is still part of every interaction. Um, and it was a, something that's great for me to remember as I moved throughout my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I thought um, for me, it was really powerful. And I think similar to you, Ignacio, it was kind of triggering in a way, mm -hmm. in a way that I didn't anticipate. Because I've seen, you know, other, you know, kinds of 
news magazine pieces and things kind of, you know, talking about the crack epidemic, but there was something about the way in which this pulled everything together. And maybe because it was so much, it pulled on so much of my personal memory. Mm, yeah. uh, and even though I didn't grow up in, you know, LA or New York, which is where a lot of the documentary sort of took place being from Cleveland, Ohio, but it definitely, um, you know, kind of traverse that history. And I, I remember um, it, it made me just think about the first time I kind of remember even hearing about crack. And it was um, in Cleveland. I grew up in a neighborhood called Garden Valley um, here in Cleveland. Um, it was one of the poorest neighborhoods in the city in the housing projects. And I remember my, my aunt's partner, uh, my uncle Leon, <laughs> saying to my aunt and to my mother at some family function that, and this must have been like 83, 84-ish or, you know, um, he was like, it's some new shit on the street called crack. <laughs> he said to my mother and my aunt, it is fucking people up. And if I catch either one of y'all doing it, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like it's gonna be hell to pay, right? And it was like, you know, my my aunt's part of my uncle essentially is um friend. And then, you know, and shortly thereafter, beginning to then see the impact of it, right? Um, from you know, uh kids, uh uh, you know, uh, parents, right, that I was in school mm -hmm. with or people in the neighborhood, you start to really see the impact. And I think, um, and so seeing the documentary kind of made me think about uh, a lot of that, uh, you know, just history that I lived and the way in which it showed up in my own life and eventually my own family. Um, and then the, I think the, the other thing about it that um, I guess is my one critique of the film mm -hmm. is that it really, it left HIV out of the I discussion. Know. And there's no way to talk about the impact of the crack epidemic and then the kind of war on drugs that it yeah. was the excuse to sort of spread without think tracking it alongside the you know AIDS epidemic in black communities and how those things worked so much in tandem. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a larger critique I have about kind of the erasure of the politics of AIDS in sort of black history as it mm. often gets retold. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Absolutely. Yes. Jamie, your reactions? Uh, for me, I think, you know, it just put me right back. I moved to DC in 1990 um, and uh, was starting to try to recover from my own uh, addiction. Um, and I mean, it was just such a line of demarcation in the recovery rooms. I mean, you sort of had, you had old people who had been on heroin for a long time or had been drinking for mm -hmm. a long time, but crack was like so fucking fast and just took everybody out and, um, you know, it was it was like a trauma inside of a trauma space. Yeah. You know? um, and and I was living in the neighborhoods then too, and I could just see it all over the neighborhood. All the men who were going, all the women who were incredibly desperate. Uh, I mean, the neighborhood that I lived in then is now white. I think because of crack, right? I mean, it was the removal mm -hmm. plan uh, that 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 paved the way for you know, Petworth now to be this hipster uh, place. And I mean, I, it, was, it was just unbelievably devastating. Mm. Something in the documentary, someone said, um, crack changed the black community and that changed America. Um, and so that, I think that was very profound a, a statement. And, and, and thinking about my own, you know, experience with that, uh, crack like destroyed my neighborhood and, and my family. Uh, there were many, um, there were several uh, people who were affected by uh, crack in my family, um, my neighborhood, my neighbor, like so many people that I knew, like literally it felt like my neighborhood was just falling apart, just completely falling apart. And I heard it just like you did, Kenyon. I heard people, you know, people talking about this new shit, this new shit that you shouldn't take. And then of course the the fear, fear and fear tactics around, you know, the very first time. You know, like, uh, and and then the the political, just the political mess around it, 
right? So in, in this, so let's first like, let's first talk about like how it changed the black community and how it changed America. And in connection to that, it's just like uh, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, all of these presidents here. And what the fuck did they do? <laughs> what did they do uh, within, when, when this was happening? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, one of the things that um, just even again in my memory as a kid and watching, um, you know, the uh, effects of the addiction, which as you mentioned, I think one of the reasons why it was so alarming, even within the community, was the experience with addiction had been uh, heroin primarily, right? Mm -hmm. Which just as a drug and the impact of it, you know, people who were, um, you know, addicted to heroin or using heroin or whatever, um, you know, were, you know, I mean, you know, heroin is a, is a downer, it's a mellow, people are, you know, there's a, and I think that the experience of the, the turn from that to, uh, you know, to, to cocaine use at such a level and the, the, the uh, frenetic energy of it, the, uh, the mm -hmm. kind of desperation because the high didn't last that long, you know, all, the, all of that I think was um, so jarring uh, to people as, as one piece. And then I think the, the other thing I think about is um, how we start to just see f the police forces increase yeah you know, in the hood uh, as a result of crack. So there just were, um, you know, it, it really took well, like I'm living in a housing project and I even as young yeah. as I was, there wasn't the kind of like um, police presence until crack started to really uh, become a thing. And, and probably connected to that was the public policy that put the resources to in hire right. more police and right. drive them into certain communities. Um, you know, to sort of police, you know, um, crack use and sales or whatever. Right. And so then to see at by the point that that started to happen, at least in Cleveland, by like the late 80s, when I was like, uh, in my like, early, I was like 13, 14, you know, years old around that time. So then, like, the people who are like my friends and people like my age who lived in the hood, who were some who were like dealing crack start to like, either, you know, get shot by each other by police, like that element of it. Uh, and that actually, it was to me in a lot of ways that the sort of police interference and the police kind of engagement with the issue and the way in which they engaged became the really scary. And that was the part at which my mother was like, oh no, I we're gonna get the fuck up out of here. And that's when we moved to Cleveland Heights when I was 14. So, um, you know, it, it, because just the, the level of like violence was so escalated, um, you know, at that time. Mm, it seemed like the, the whole domino effect that was happening. Um, even thinking about like uh, the, the the misconception around um, who was doing crack and um, and then being conflated with who was selling crack and why people were selling crack, it's such a, a this this thing that feeds on itself and just more police, more murders, more prison, uh, increased uh, sentencing. Later on, three strikes rule. I mean, there's so many things connected to this shit, but very much connected to um, the just uh, white men in power. Yeah, <laughs> really. and if I could say quickly too, Ignacio, just to that point, like, so when we moved, left the hood and moved to Cleveland Heights, and then I went to a prep school, mostly white prep school here in the Cleveland area, and then began to kind of, like, I saw more drugs <laughs> in that high school, mm. and there were either white kids who were dealing coke in that high school, or kids who were going to my old neighborhood in the hood to buy drugs, yeah. right? Um, and that was just like so, you know, astounding just to see that that was like so much a part. Of it. And this the documentary also deals with that too. That like so many of the actual people who were buying drugs were from like the white suburbs in New York City. Um, although that's not who was being policed, and those neighborhoods right. were not being policed in the same way. And that was something that I remember just seeing as you know going to, to a predominantly white prep school and and seeing how many kids were going right. through the hood to buy drugs, right? Mm. Yeah, I didn't grow up like, so I can't speak to like experiencing what this shift um, looked like or felt like um, personally. Um, but one of the things that, that I kept coming back to while watching this documentary 
is like, I've always had a lot of questions about the older generation. I've had these conversations with my mother. Like, why did you all um, allow certain things or support certain things, especially when it came to policing and, and like the crime bill and all of these things? Um, when, like, I know my mother in particular, like she had no history of turning to the police and trusting them. Um, and this documentary just made it so much clearer how systematically they yeah. destroyed any other option to turn to. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't even that the people who were turning to this or supporting the crime bill um, or now still have problems grappling with abolition um, right. that they believe that policing is like an adequate way to to address conflict um but just that there had been so much damage done to the ways that we were able to address conflict within communities um that there was just no other way to turn mm -hmm. i think it illuminated that there's so much work to do to rebuild those things and rebuild yeah. trust um especially when we're having conversations across generations mm -hmm. um in a way that um that made my work a lot more clear after seeing this documentary Mm, thank you. And I, I think so clearly of Bill Clinton coming in with his saxophone and <laughs> black culture and like, we, here's our first black president, everybody. <laughs> he walked up Georgia Avenue right near my house, right? And he was like, this is the first president who's ever taken a walk up Georgia Avenue. And what did he do? He like, he, he funded a bajillion police to come, you know, boots on the ground to fucking decimate Georgia Avenue. He was supposed mm -hmm. to create like all these businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel like, and then he killed welfare. So it was right. like, there's just so many things on top of each other, taking money and resources out of the neighborhoods and then making it look like this is a character problem, which, you know, fuck the Democrats on that shit. I mean, they <laughs> that up and down, um, you know, it was just, you know, what, what a time that was. I always feel like when I think about how I failed my kids as, a, as, a, uh, as an activist, it's like why I didn't just chain myself to, the, to something and not <laughs> leave while all the welfare shit was happening, while the crime bill was happening. And, and, you know, all these nonprofits, everybody's talking to each other about it. Like, what the fuck? You know, this is supposed to be the good new administration coming right. in. Um, but, uh, you know, look all the stuff that's happened since, you know, um, it's just really such a terrible turning point. Mm. When you um, talk about welfare, it brings up a big uh, discussion for me about black women in this documentary. They bring it up so good. And I've been watching several documentaries that really bring together how women, specifically black women have been viewed. Um, and here it was really about the black mother not taking care of her child or black women being arrested for being pregnant while addicted to crack. I mean, fuck, I remember when that was happening, like very, very clearly. And, I, and then this idea of uh, the crack baby, um, which I actually did not know was based on one report after watching this documentary. That, that just was like, went like wildfire, the crack baby thing, which wasn't based uh, on a lot of research or anything. Yeah, so the, the way uh, women have been viewed and even the book, I'm not sure, the, the bell curve, uh, the bell curve coming out to like, just be like, uh, basically, this is the proof, <laughs> you know, like uh, survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. Some of us are more intelligent and then basing it on race. And then out of that, I think comes the strong black women because black men were just not cutting it, right? Black men ain't shit, so black women have to be strong. So it's almost this juxtaposing of, like this thing about women, like either you are so strong, nobody needs to help you, or you're this horrible fucking person <laughs> that can't take care of your kids and you need to be blamed for everything. All right. So I think that was a big piece in this documentary as well. Um, you know, I think that a lot of the kind of responses in the, you know, community. So once, you know, kind of post the crime bill passed, and then I think that is kind of when it felt like, or at least in now remembering where more um, critical voices around the kind of policing and, and the, you know, prison boom that happened as a result really began to kind of take shape during the first Clinton um, administration. And 
you know, a lot of the focus, um, which is something that we're still obviously debating today was around the impact, you know, kind of mass in incarceration and the drug war, you know, on black, you know, cisgender men in particular, right, as a um, as a focus and, and, and less on women. And I, and part of that, I think, and one, one of these that I have often talked about, and even, you know, folks like Beth Ritchie and other folks have, have subsequently written about is, um, you know, so if we think of thinking about the impact as specifically related to just prisons and jails, and certainly we saw like the, you know, expansion of black women being, you know, imprisoned uh, at that period, you know, but but of course, you know, men were also were far more like imprisoned in that system. Mm -hmm. But we don't talk about these other sort of things that also happen that criminalize black women and low income women around drugs. So like, in relationship to both the crime bill and the Welfare Reform Act, which was mm -hmm. what a year or two later, yeah. which began to then take away social safety net programs right. from women. If you had been convicted of a drug conviction, then you couldn't get welfare or states could at least choose to not allow for women to get uh, access to food stamps or welfare if they had been convicted. So that starts to happen. If you had access to public housing right. and uh, you or someone who was living under your dwelling was arrested and charged with drug offenses, you could lose public housing forever. So I think like the, and so we don't often think about those, the kind of ancillary structures, which were super devastating to black women, even if they in fact weren't even using drugs right. or you, you know, but um, that that had a, a, a an impact in a way that we often just, when we just focus on, you know, the sort of numbers of folks in the actual prison or jail itself, I think we miss the sort of gender, uh, you know, the yeah. aspects of gender that the drug war and prison expansion, you know, really had particularly on, on black women at the time. Mm. I just keep on feeling like it's such a, every, everything reminds me of fucking slavery, just everything, you know, because it's like, here are the black men, black men are the problem, get rid of the black men, rape the women or get rid of the black men and take the children away. You separate families, you destroy everybody, you destroy community. And it always brings me back to that. It always, and it, even, even, you know, what's happening at the border, you know, the destruction of family, you break down the family, you break down your connections. It's just done. You know, and the, the, the view of, you know, or the vision of what we thought of when we think about welfare, when we think about crack, when we think about all that, most people automatically think black, black people, blackness, you know, <laughs> and we don't think about uh, white folks. In the documentary, they mentioned this blew my mind from 1988 to 1994, no white person was convicted of a federal crack offense in Los Angeles from 19 fucking 88 to 1994. Not that I am condoning arrests and stuff, but do you see my point? Like right. yeah. no white person. So what does that mean? That says a lot. That says a fucking lot, right? Yeah, no, I, I would say being an NA in, uh, in DC in the nineties, it was just like, you know, who was going to treatment? Who was coming out of Lorton? You know, who was, I mean, it was just absolutely, you know. And at one point I went to rehab, <laughs> a really good friend who said, and I know you didn't go to one of those rehabs where they hang a sign on you, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, I went to the yoga, you know, Olympic sized pool rehab. You know? <laughs> um, and everybody else, if they were lucky enough to get treatment, were going into these, what they call them, therapeutic communities, which were kind of jail. Mm -hmm. you know, it was just like, and the whole plan was to break you down and humiliate mm. you and you know you'd have you had to work while you were in there i mean they were just it was, you know and they were springing up everywhere because they were fucking funded you know that was where mm. all my other friends in na went you know while i went to an lgbtq you know new open rehab you know <laughs> meet a meetings in the neighborhood and you know in houston i was in houston for rehab and it's just you know I mean, the difference between actually getting support, I mean, that was a pivotal time for me. It, it changed my whole trajectory. It helped me like get a handle on my sexual abuse, my trauma, uh, and made me realize I had to make a lifelong commitment to, you know, that I had major depression and PTSD, as opposed to somebody reinforcing it, right. you know, creating more trauma. Mm -hmm. But I think, feel like, I feel like almost like <laughs> crack or the, the crack was almost like a, I guess a, 
this indication that white supremacy was right, you know, or something like that. <laughs> so weak, look at this community falling apart, right? <laughs> like that no one else had anything to do with this, you know, black people just decided to destroy themselves and their communities. Um, and th this documentary, although it falls short on some things, you know, like I feel like it, it definitely reminds us about the layers, you know, because we're just talking about a few of the layers. There's so many, so, so much more that goes into why crack was even available in our communities, why it kept coming in, why it wasn't being stopped, um, you know, um, the support of, you know, the actual support of drugs coming into our community and continuing to kill people. Um, and how um, thinking about like just power, I mean, just the name crack, cocaine, corruption and conspiracy, that's exactly what it was, is corruption and conspiracy at the expense of black people and poor people yeah. Yeah. This whole conversation and the documentary, the thing that um, kept coming up for me too was just how intention, how smart their targeting was. Like uh, that wasn't mm. specifically spoken about in the documentary, but in so many different ways, they were doing things that would be, would have like a very specific way of breaking things up and contributing to these problems. And it just was so smart like white supremacy is just a very very smart evolving thing mm -hmm. um and um it's i think that that is a, a really great reminder especially with how we um are um forced to deal with um you know these issues in, in different uh, mutations of them now um because we'll be saying looking back and saying the same things about issues that are happening now and saying like, oh this really happened 10 years prior um, and um, just seeing those things and how they, they, they plant the seeds of that much earlier than, than how it actually erupts um, was really illuminating. Um, I wanna, uh, <laughs> I'm thinking about, uh, um, what's her name? Um, I was like, what's her name? The first lady, Reagan. Um, Nancy. 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 Yeah, that little little thing. Nancy Reagan, when she, you know, her campaign, I, I just can't get over it. Like, I just say no, right? But I'm thinking about this in, in two ways, right? So when uh, just say no, so simplistic. <laughs> so I'm like, just put it all on the kids, you know, just say no. But I'm also just like in doing a parallel and thinking about why this documentary or why this, this uh, topic is important to be talking about, you know, generationally, like not forget about the crack epidemic and how it, you know, could uh, connect to prevention or talking about sexual liberation or sexual violence and how it permeates and stuff. I'm thinking about just saying no about the drugs. And then I'm thinking about the campaign, you know, like the anti, you know, like uh, anti-violence campaign of, did you say no? And then about kids, you know, like, uh, tell someone. It's always put on the person or people that are being oppressed or something, you know, it's just like, oh, it's simple. Just say no. Did you say no while you were being raped? You know, like <laughs> it doesn't fucking matter. Right. So it's uh, I'm thinking about these campaigns, how crappy they were, but also like, why is this of any importance to talk to young people at any age, actually? What's the connection? Yeah. I mean, I, I think just say no, as Sari was saying, it's so brilliant, right? I mean, it's such a brilliant strategy to make this an individual character issue. Yeah. Not an issue of like all the structural violence that's in the communities and, you know, how, how, how desperate and how few options people have to just have a life, right? And how, how much, you know, the drugs come into that space very intentionally. But when I think about all the work we've been doing for years around sexism, sexual liberation, mm -hmm. and you know, you know, recovery from sexual assault, just say no is what you tell every girl to do around yeah. her sexuality, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like really, you know, an appropriate girl, you just won't have sex. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. And and if sex then happens to you, as you say, in various violent contexts, consensual, not consensual, it's just your fault. It's just, you right. know, you're, you're um you know, there's something wrong with you as a human being and your character. And um, I mean, I think the brilliance of BLM in this moment 
is that it's really ripped the lid off this idea of individuality. And you can see the structures. You can see how big they are, how massive they are, and how even when there's tons of community outrage, they're still going. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. I think you know, lots of people thought like after Ferguson, oh, you know, I remember there was this thing people was calling about the, the Ferguson effect, like police were going to be somehow more accountable or, or <laughs> less trigger happy or less, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, the Ferguson effect. I mean, what the fuck? You know, what we've seen is more of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think that is the gift of this moment and this generation's organizing, which is to somehow finally really make the structural violence visible in a way that it hasn't been on a massive scale to people who mm -hmm. really were resistant to thinking about it that way. Yeah, I think we were able to, like, I think part of what... Um, you know, for me has happened in the last, you know, decade of, of BLM and well, less than a decade, but, you know, roughly, um, you know, in some ways I, I, again, thinking about the sort of trajectory of like what, you know, happened in terms of like activism and organizing the black community. And it just feels to me like we, for decades, were just reeling from one disastrous crisis to the next, yeah. right? So, we come out of the 1960s with all these assassinations with, uh, you know, that were triggering and traumatizing. I always, you know, tell people my mother, when she was like 18, 19, was, had joined the Black Panther Party in Cleveland. Um, and she got out when Fred Hampton was assassinated, even mm -hmm. though it was in Chicago, 300 miles away. But she had my older sister at the time, was a single mom, and it was too dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. And so... Um, you know, she left, you know, the party at that point. And um, I think that, so we were, you know, dealing with all of those assassinations, the violent dismantling of, you know, the Black Panther and other kind of Black leftist organizations. And I always point to people, to be frank, that the, the, the feds left, um, while they, they sort of dismantled the, you know, Black, you know, Marxist, right? Essentially, the Black Panther Party certainly, you know, could be considered. Um, they left the more sort of cultural nationalists, which were more conservative around gender roles and around, you know, like they and and more kind of pro-black capitalism as framed. So, like, you know, the Nation of Islam, the range of organizations that would fit that category, those were left intact, right? So, you know, so what we so then we come into the 1980s where we have you know, the, the, the drug war happening. Um, and the, again, the Black Panther Party had, a, you know, they were already doing some things around, um, you know, treatment for substance use and uh, creating their own kind of harm reduction programs or whatever in some, some place in the country where there were still chapters by, by the late 70s. Um, and then you have HIV, right, happen at the same time. And so it, it is of no wonder, frankly, that the black political forces that were left intact by the state, uh, you know, so you have the emergence of like black political leadership, black mayors and and uh, congressional reps, you know, who many of whom come out of the civil rights movement who lead, you know, are now in Congress or running cities. And then you have, um, you know, the more sort of cultural nationalists who kind of frankly, would support the, the sort of ab drug abstinence and not harm reduction and also, you know, uh, have a particularly conservative frame around the AIDS epidemic and, and are homophobic, to be sure. And all of these, you know, so it so the, the fact that we have some community support for the crime bill in in 94. Um, and I should admit that it wasn't necessarily uniform, right? Because even, I mean, even fucking Bernie Sanders <laughs> gave a speech against the crime bill, right? Which is, <laughs> you know, um, so there were some people who were critiquing it, right? I just, I raised it to say that, but but the, the kind of black political forces that would have probably been at play to actually mobilize the community, both around drugs and, and the, the harms of the, the, the kind of violence that was happening around crack, uh, around the HIV epidemic, um, you know, and then obviously challenging the kind of state forces to to respond differently in both of those cases, those organizations were dismantled and gone and people were either shot dead or they were in prison. Mm -hmm. And what was left were the, and that, which is also why in the late 80s, early 90s, which we're beginning to frankly see again, all of the kinds of like, 
you know, uh, cultural nationalist sort of ideas about black progress, right? W which we're now, mm -hmm. so there's, we're beginning to see this sort of backlash against like queer and trans sort of like liberation in the black community, which a lot of what I'm seeing on the internet mirrors the shit that people were saying in the late, in the nineties, mm -hmm. in these uh, cultural nationalist 5% nation, Afrocentric quote unquote, uh, like we're seeing the same thing all over again, mm -hmm. right? And I, to me, um, so I, I often think about part of that is because of what was the groups that were, were different that were dismantled by the state. And only really recently are we beginning to see that kind of energy of black political formations that are pro-feminist, that are have queer and trans leadership, that are questioning capitalism and, and you know, a range of things in, in a way that we hadn't seen at, th at this level since like the, the 1970s. Yeah. Mm. Um, the parallels between like the, the sexual violence conversation and the crack also bring to mind for me um, the importance of uh, putting under the microscope carceral feminisms and the response to sexual violence with police and prisons. Mm -hmm. um, like as if we've seen how policing um, can be part of the very same system that they're supposed to be protecting us from. And they did it in such an ingenious way with crack epidemic. They were pl major players in everything that was going down at every stage of what was going down, um, which is the same thing with sexual violence police. Um, that's huge within um, policing communities. And so I think it calls on us to reevaluate turn our turn to policing as a response to those kinds of harms within our community as well. Um, and um, especially as I think one of the things that I, um, that has been like a through line of everything that I'm saying is that um, we have to learn from this history and not repeat it, even though mm -hmm. all of these systems mutate into something different. Um, and I think that that's one of the, the primary areas where we can learn from this um, is, is with our response to sexual violence using the same carceral system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and th there's just like, um, I've thought about so many different ways um, in thinking about this. And I think a lot about the welfare <clears throat> because I was on welfare, I was an independent parent, and I was on welfare at the time where all, all of these things were happening with the continued welfare reform and cuts and things. And I just keep remembering all of the um, policies that came through around, um, you know, basically sterilizing um, poor women um, and also like um, nor plants, you know, asking, telling women if they put the nor plant in their arms to not get pregnant, then they would give them you know, a thousand or two thousand dollars. They stayed with the the father of the child. You know, all of these kind of things, uh, um, which was totally uh, like counteracting their sexual rights and liberation, their reproductive rights, um, just because of poverty. Um, and I'm re remembering navigating that system constantly and how it felt. <laughs> two, two, two examples. I think I mean, once after my daughter was born, and I was at the welfare office waiting to see a, a worker. What this white woman, a worker, came up to me and asked me, "I'm holding my little baby," and she's like, "Oh, what? What's the baby's name?" And I said, "Amanda," and she straight up said, "Oh, I thought you were gonna tell me her name was Shaniqua, or something like that," and walked away. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> the bitch just walked God. away. Said that I was like. And another time in the welfare office, a white man was there trying to sign up for it and think somebody told him something he didn't like. And he just like get, did this huge, like, uh, you know, temper tantrum about if he were a black pregnant woman, uh, you know, he, they, they, he would be taken seriously. Oh, oh, oh really? Yes. <laughs> yes. Wow. <laughs> yes. And also all of the policies that went through schools, right? Um, the um, um, charitable choice, you know, um, trying to get, trying to destroy the separation between church and state, you know, I'll do this. Uh, and um, the fatherhood initiative, um, when, you know, the abstinence and se until sex education, all that went through through welfare, <laughs> all of that. And a lot of people don't know that all of these policies around no sex education, trying to get women to stay with their abusive, you know, fathers of their children, all of it, welfare, welfare, welfare. Um, which contributed to the idea of, you know, black women and black mamas um, and, and blackness, period. Um, so to me, it's like, uh, to me, every 
movement is connected to prevention or CSA prevention. That, that is, that's my take. Because at the, at the core, at the very like rawest form of power is the sexual violence and power over a child. Mm -hmm. And that is used consistently in wartime. It is used all over. Um, right now, children are being raped as we speak. And that is very uncomfortable for people to hear. Right. So it, to me, it's also about the, the um, not just the secrecy, because crack was something everybody was talking about and stuff, but it's uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, the kind of thing that we do. Right. You know, I remember being in my neighborhoods, everybody's on crack, but nobody really talked about it. You know what I mean? It was like, stay away from that person. Don't go over there. It was always like, this is how you take care, but we're not actually talking about the thing. And so it's like this almost um, uh, ignoring the very thing that's right in your fucking face. And that's the way I see sexual violence, child sexual abuse. It's ignoring the thing like, it's like fucking right there. But for many people, it's about, we need to move on. We need to go on. It's a survival mechanism that doesn't work for everybody. Right? So that, I see those connections like that. Ooh, you just reminding me, I'm thinking about like white supremacy and capitalism and that sort of meld and, and what you're talking about the, um, you know, the kind of like straight up amnesia it creates as people are right in the thing. When I, I was in rural central Pennsylvania in the 80s running a rape crisis center. So all day long, I'm listening to all this intense violence and you know, Reagan's president and like he's talking about the cities as these cesspools of violence and where I'm living in rural central Pennsylvania as like, you know, Nirvana, like there's no violence out here in rural. And so many of the women in the shelter are running from their cops, right? Yeah. So many of the children who have been sexually abused, right? And what's happening in the community is these farmers who have voted for Reagan twice are losing their farms to factory farms and the entire economy is turning into a prison economy. Mm. And, you know, and I'm drinking. So every night I'm drinking at the bar with these white farmers who love Reagan and he's killing them and these prison guards wow. while doing this work. I mean, you know, my addiction was, you know, wow. <laughs> and um, <laughs> like, what a front seat to, how these policies are playing out, you know, and how white people consistently, you know, in the, um, you know, the fantasy of, you know, white, uh, you know, landed gentry, you know what I mean, or whatever, yeah. the fantasy of white supremacy, like uh, destroy themselves, just they destroyed their own families, mm. you know, yeah. you know, in all this, you know, racist view of who, was violent, who was a drug addict, who was a sexual abuser or any kind of an abuser, uh, just, and they loved Reagan. I mean, my God, I fought every night in those bars. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you even see that dynamic now in the, we talked about the sort of opioid crisis. And oh my God. About it. And, and you know, and it's, it's, you know, the now cliche, you know, everybody's like, yeah, we're the sympathy and the way we're responding differently is, you know, because mm -hmm. it, you know, at least initially was viewed as, um, you know, an issue for white rule America. And, th and that is certainly true. Um, but yeah, but we're, I feel like kind of seeing the same dynamics in the sense that, um, you know, so we just, are, you know, in the midst of that and being, you know, back in Ohio now with um, prior to COVID opioid deaths were, uh, you know, from my reading before I moved back, like one of the number one, you know, sort of reasons for mortality in the state of Ohio. So, um, and, and particularly um, in the, the Southern part of the state. Um, so, but, but the kind of like um, rage about you know, a system that, first of all, allowed the pharma companies to just dump, uh, you know, prescription drugs in Appalachia and in these places, you know, isn't there as much as people are mad that, you know, trans people get to go to the bathroom in their bathroom of choice or, you know, um, or it's still the imagining of, this, of the sort of, you know, 
Black and Latinx cities as like the sort of place where there's crime and trauma and whatever. And that, you know what I mean? Which fueled the, you know, Trump era, right? And so there's this weird, like, you know, way in which, you know, we're still living that sort of dynamic where, you know, it has become about, um, you know, and I I would say too, this, I had a similar, you know, experience when I was, I went to college in central Ohio, um, in uh, Ohio Western University, um, in a town of less than 20,000 people. And I worked, I lived there the whole four years. I didn't come back and forth because I worked for the public school system in town. And I worked in one of the, like the elementary schools on one of the like poor sides of town. And it it started to just break my heart, the number of children who I would find out over the course of that four years who had been or were at some point currently dealing with childhood sexual abuse in their Mm -hmm. homes. And, you know, right. And, but, but at the time, this is also, this is the mid nineties where the cities are imagined, where Cleveland, my city is imagined in the state of Ohio to be the most sort of, you know, ghetto and depraved and the most black and I, you know, the way in which it's imagined in the, in the, politics of the rest of the state. Meanwhile, like, you know, all these kids, a lot of them white kids, but not include, you know, are dealing with, you know, this level of like, you know, trauma and also drugs were there too and a whole range of things. But, um, you know, the, the way in which people can kind of displace their kind of um, imagination of violence onto some other body into some other location, right? you know, then creates a situation where, you know, we actually could be doing something to sort of transform this society for everybody, but getting past white folks need to (laughs) just be, you know, white above everything else. (laughs) Whatever the fuck else is going on, I'm white, so fuck it. (laughs) Like it it, it has impeded our ability to really, you know, move things in a way uh, that that could just not only sort of dismantle that, but, um, you know, create real, uh, a a new society, both for folks in cities and in rural places, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I would say is thank you so much for joining me to connect the dots on this documentary. I think it's really important. I think it's a topic that, um, we're not talking about enough and how it connects to so many things like we brought up here. And I'll leave uh, with this in terms of connecting the dots as using media as a way to educate is one of the things in the documentary that is like keeps ringing in my head is every like people talking about uh, Scarface, right? That when they watched Scarface, it was like a romanticizing cocaine, right? Cocaine became this luxury drug, right? And so like, even with that show, I know so many people, so many black people that have that, that, that uh, poster, right? They idolize Scarface, you know, because cocaine was so luxurious since, you know, and so even there, that right there, there's a conversation about how drugs are being uh, sold to us, really, how they're being sold to us, and even the racism and classism within that alone, and then just follow I always say it's a domino effect, just follow the fucking dominoes to see those connections. But how media has such a strong impact on how we see things, how we think things are beautiful and how we like uh, make, uh, how we discriminate against many others as we've seen black women, black men, black people, right? So thank you so much uh, for another Connecting the Dots. Um, Please join us uh, next time. And thank you so much. If anybody wants to say one last thing, this is your chance. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. This was so great. I have to run, but this was a beautiful conversation. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you, Harry. Thank you. It's great to all see right. you all of you. Wonderful. Yay. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're busy, busy, busy. Well, I didn't watch the documentary, right? No, you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I did it all right. <laughs> thank you. <All> right. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,